welcome to the Lee Fumble House Museum. My name is Amanda and I'm the manager of interpretation here. Uh, we do apologize. We were supposed to be doing a live stream tour of the house this afternoon, but we had too many technical difficulties. So uh, we are going to be posting this video for you all to watch. And if you have any questions, please feel free to post those uh, while you're watching it. We will get back to you with the answers on that. And again, I do apologize. But it's a beautiful day today. We are standing out here in the garden of the Lee Fundle House Museum. So we're looking at the back side of the house. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the history of the house, we are going to start out with a little brief uh, introduction and timeline to the history. And then we're really gonna dig into the sort of architectural side of the house. Um, not only the styles and how they changed here over the years, but also how home technology changed. Um, and just how the house has been impacted by the different people who have lived here over the years. So the house itself, the Lee Fundle House, was constructed in 1785. It was built as a home for Philip Fendel and his, uh, his family. Philip Fendel was a member of the Lee family, and Lee and Fendel families. Uh, and the Lee family, of course, very prominent family in Virginia. The Fendels, a very prominent family in Maryland. So Philip Fendel was actually born and raised in Southern Maryland, but he ends up back down here in Virginia. He does uh, marry some of his Lee family cousins. And so he ends up building a home here in Alexandria. Uh, 1785, of course, uh, is just after the American Revolution. So the house um, was built during a very booming period in Alexandria history. And it was lived in by various members of the Lee family, actually all the way up until 1903. Uh, and so it was very much a Lee family home. It's actually situated on the corner of Washington Street and Orinoco. Uh, what is actually designated now as Lee Corner because there were so many members of the Lee family that had their homes uh, right here at this intersection. Uh, for point of placement, we are four blocks north of King Street here in Alexandria. So when this house was built in 1785, it was very much on the outskirts of town. So when you looked north uh, from this house, we would have been looking mostly at farmland uh, when this house was constructed. So we were on the very edges of town. Now the house has undergone a lot of changes over the years. Um, it was lived in as a family home through the 1960s. And today we're gonna sort of uh, highlight four major periods in the house's history. We're gonna refer back to them as we're exploring the architecture and changes uh, to the house here. So the first period we're gonna be talking about, of course, is the period the house was built in, in the 1780s. Uh, in 1850, there's a huge renovation to the house when the Casanoves move in. Now the Casanoves uh, were a very wealthy merchant family here in Alexandria. They marry into the Lee family. So again, they're still, it's still in Lee family hands. Uh, and then this house uh, does undergo another major renovation uh, in the early 1900s. Now in 1903, the house is purchased by the Downham family. They are the first family who are not uh, related to the Lees to move in. Uh, they're actually very prosperous liquor dealers here in Alexandria. And they live in the home from 1903 uh, to about uh, 1929 or so, and they do, do eventually move out. They um, eventually end up selling the house in 1937 to the final resident owners, John L. Lewis, uh, the labor union leader, and his wife, Myrta Lewis. And the Lewises are the last people to actually reside in the house as a home. So as we go through today, we're gonna to be referring mainly to those four uh, families and those four periods of time here in the house. So we're gonna to start today with the building and the construction of the home. So like I said, Philip Fendel has his house constructed in 1785 um, and the style of the house is actually very unique. It is not like most of the other houses here in Alexandria. It is a wooden house, it's not built of brick. Uh, and the shape of it is actually what is referred to as a telescope house. And the telescope house was actually a very common house style that developed in Southern Maryland, where Fendel was from, Charles County. Uh, and he brings it here with him. So we think that Fendel had a lot of influence on the, the house and how it was constructed and how it looked in the end. A lot of gentlemen like Fendel consider themselves sort of amateur architects. So we think he had a strong hand, like I said, in the, in the house and how it, how it was built. But of course, the house itself was built mostly by enslaved laborers. We know that Philip Fendel is actually enslaving 51 uh, African Americans who are working, many of them, to build this house in 1785. We know that from the tax records here in Alexandria. 
Uh, we know he's enslaving some very skilled blacksmiths and carpenters, very skilled craftsmen, um, and they're doing a lot of the work of, of constructing this house. So we've actually moved in through the back door of the house, and we're standing here in uh, the back part of the main hallway. And we're looking at a part of the wall that has actually been exposed. When we were doing renovation work back in 2006, a section of the plaster wall was removed and it revealed some very interesting information about how this house was constructed. I mentioned the house was a wooden house, but uh, we know that there are bricks that fill the interior walls of the main home. And this was done purposefully. When the house was constructed, um, very unique to the telescope style house was the fact that the kitchen was inside the home, was connected to the house. It was one of, in one of those telescoping sections. It was not a separate building. And of course, uh, when you have a kitchen inside your home, you're dealing with a very large hearth, uh, and there is the risk of, of fire. And just in general, in a wooden house, you are very much at risk of burning down. So what they end up doing when they construct the home is they stuff these bricks inside the walls to form firewalls. Uh, it's called brick nogging, and it was not uncommon to find in, in homes of the period. We were very excited, of course, when we discovered it in, in, um, in 2006. We, there were references to the brick fill um, prior to that, but to see it in person was very exciting, so we wanted to show it to you today. These bricks were produced um, most likely by hand. Uh, there were several the large um, brick manufacturers in Alexandria following the Revolutionary War, so in 1785. There are several competing uh, brick manufacturers. So as I said, a lot of bricks available here. We have a lot of coarse clay soil. So a lot of the homes in Alexandria did utilize brick. So we are standing here in what is the uh, south parlor of the main home. So this is the parlor that is on the back side of the house. Uh, you have a main central hallway and then two parlor rooms here um, off the hall. So if you're coming in through the back door, um, parlor rooms are going to be to the left. And this back parlor room, uh, it is a room that would have been probably in the 1780s, a very multi-functioning space. So right now we actually have the room set for uh, dinner, but the furniture was very easily moved around and the room would have been reconfigured throughout the day for whatever was taking place in the room at the time. So uh, you can see in the back side of the room we do have a sewing box, so in the evening uh, the family could gather in this room and they could relax, uh, they could read loud, they could do some sewing, the kids could play with their, their toys and games. Uh, so this room would have been, as I said, a very multi-purpose space uh, originally when, when the house was built. Uh, the room has a couple of interesting features. Like I said, the house has changed a lot over the years. You can read a lot of these different layers as you go through the house. The main feature in here in this room that is original to 1785 uh, is actually going to be the crown molding that you see, um, the cornice molding around the top of the room. Uh, that is original. But a lot of the other features have been altered, including uh, these very tall, beautiful windows. These were not the original windows that were here in the 1780s. These were added during that major 1850 renovation, which we're going to talk more about uh, in the next room. So we're standing here in the north parlor of the house. Uh, this room is furnished as a typical formal parlor might have looked in the 1850s. Uh, and you can see uh, the house, this room would have been really very formal, it would have been used uh, really to entertain important visitors, to celebrate important family milestones like births and weddings and, and things of that nature. And I do want to talk about in this room mainly the, the major 1850 renovation of the house. The way the house looks today, um, in many ways, is, is, is due to what happened in the 1850s. And I want to introduce the two, behind, the two people behind us on the wall. Uh, this is Louis Cazenove and his wife Harriet. Harriet was a member of the Lee family, and she marries Louis, and of course he's a very wealthy merchant in Alexandria, and he, wants, he buys this house in 1850, and he sees it as a major fixer-upper. Uh, the house was quite old at that point in time, it was very unfashionable, so Louis basically sets about making it the best house in town. And he does a lot to, he basically strips the house down to the studs. Uh, and he does a lot to uh, introduce new technology to the house, um, and also new styles. So the original style of the house when it was constructed in the 1780s would have been very much in the federal style uh, that was popular at the time. 
very much inspired by the Greco sort of Roman architectural lines of the time, very, um, very simple, sort of bold lines compared to what comes later. Uh, Louis Casino is going to be very influenced by the revival styles that are becoming very popular in the uh, mid 1800s. So, for example, the Gothic Revival, the Italian style, uh, there's a number of, and the Greek Revival as well. These are all going to be sort of seen throughout the house. So it, it's funny because Louis sort of doesn't go with one pure style, he sort of takes and, and pulls from all these different styles. So uh, it ends up being sort of a, a quite eclectic in terms of what you're seeing in the house reflected architecturally. But um, Louis Casanova does a lot, like I said, to upgrade the house. So he expands the third floor of the house and, and changes the roof line quite dramatically from a traditional sort of gabled roof that would have been here in 1785 to the hipped roof style. He adds the small windows around the top of the house. So the very iconic small windows uh, around the third floor uh, of the house, those were added in the 1850s. He does, like I mentioned in the other room, elongate the windows here on the first floor of the house. So these very tall, almost floor to ceiling windows, um, the jib windows, they uh, are all from that 1850 renovation along with the ironwork that you see uh, in the outside of the house. The stone steps, the ironwork railing, the front porch, again, all of that is from the 1850s. So you're seeing the house does change quite dramatically on the exterior as well as the interior of the home. We know that the, the Casanos would have in the inside put wallpaper uh, in most of the formal main rooms here of the house. So there's evidence that they had it here in the parlor rooms and also in the dining room, which they expand, that we'll see in just a minute. Over by the fireplace here, they also decide to replace the original uh, neoclassical style mantelpieces with these marble, imported marble mantelpieces. You see the very subtle Tudor arch here. This is part of that Tudor revival uh, around the, the surround here. And it's, of course, very, very stylish uh, in the 1850s. Like I mentioned, they are, in addition to changing the style of the home, they are adding a lot of upgrades and modern home technologies that are quite new at the time. So they are adding gas lighting to the house uh, in the 1850s. Our gas works here in Alexandria, I think it opens in 1851-52, so they're hooked right into that gas works and they're having gas lighting here in the home. They're also burning coal, so they do actually eventually insert coal grates into the fireplaces to heat the house. Not only using these coal uh, fireplaces, but they actually install a coal furnace in the basement of the house. And the very popular furnaces of the time typically worked that they would, there would be air vents in the floor as well, air ducts, and the hot air would rise from the basement to the rooms above. So we do believe, um, they do reference a furnace here, we do believe um, that that was um, used to heat the house here after the 1850s. They're also installing a system of call bells in the house. So you might notice as we go through the home today, each of the rooms here uh, on the main, uh, in the main part of the house has one of these. These are porcelain knobs or levers, and they actually would have been wired underneath, behind the wall, under the floorboards, connected to a series of bells, corresponding bells in the kitchen. So these were used to summon the enslaved servants to various rooms in the house. And we're gonna be seeing those corresponding bells when we head into the kitchen a little bit later. So we're actually standing here in a room that is, we're gonna to refer to as the first telescoping section of the house. So when you look at the back of the house, um, this is that first additional section uh, that you see. Now I do wanna make a point that when the house was built as a telescoping house in 1785, uh, it was exactly the same layout as it, as it is today. So the, these telescoping sections were not added on over time, as was traditionally the case with telescoping houses. They were all constructed at once. So we're in that first telescoping section. Uh, we don't know what this first telescoping section of the house would have been utilized for in 1785, unfortunately. But we know that by 1850, when the Casanos have renovated the house, they're using this space here as their formal dining room. So today we use it as a meeting room, so we're not trying to pass this off as, as a antique table by any means. But I do want to point out a couple of features in the room. We have a wonderful reproduction gasolier light which looking at catalogs from the time period, very fashionable when the house uh, was being renovated in the 1850s. So it's very similar to probably what would have been hanging here originally when the Casanos are dining in the room. In the far corner of the room, you can see we actually have a door 
and that door would have led in the 1850s to the butler's pantry of the house. So the Casanos enslaved a number of individuals who would have been, uh, some of them would have been working to serve the food here in the dining room during meals, and they would prepare all of that, um, dishing, plating it on the fine china, polishing that silver, all that work was being done in the butler's pantry before it was presented here in the dining room very formally. And beyond that butler's pantry uh, would have been the location of the kitchen. Now, the kitchen and the butler's pantry have been heavily, heavily altered. Um, when the house became a museum, they added a bathroom into the butler's pantry area, and the kitchen is still used today. So it, it is very modern looking. But we are going to step into the kitchen, and we're going to talk about just a couple of things that have survived from the historical periods uh, of the house, and, um, and then we'll be heading up, up the back stairs. So, so you can see uh, that there are on the back wall when you enter the kitchen a series of call bells. Uh, there are only five today on the wall, but there would have been at least six or seven of them, we think, um, they were installed in the 1850s. Each one is a different size, so each one had a very different tone. Uh, and that is actually how the people who were working in this end of the house knew which room they were being called to by the sound of the bell. So I'm just going to manually ring. Unfortunately, the wires do not work anymore, but I'm going to manually ring them so you can hear the bells. It sort of settled a, t a difference there, but uh, they would have had to memorize which room corresponded with which bell uh, here. And of course, also original to the 1850s is the original pass-through window. So like I said, the butler's pantry is on the, the wall behind, and then of course the dining room is beyond that. So this was the room where the food, when it was cooked, would be passed on through to the butler's pantry where it was garnished and then served beyond that. We are gonna circle around to the uh, kitchen hearth here. Uh, this is not the original cooking hearth. Uh, we do not know what happened to the original cooking hearth or exactly how it looked in 1785, but it was most likely located uh, here originally. But we know by 1850, when the Casanos, again, they renovate the house quite extensively, we believe they're actually using a coal cook stove at that point. So the kitchen does change dramatically during those 1850, the 1850s when the Casanos are here. This current uh, hearth was actually installed in the house in around 1940, when the last family, uh, the Lewises, that I referred to earlier in the introduction, they move in. And of course, Myrna Lewis, uh, the woman of the house, she was very interested in Virginia history. She loved collecting antique furniture. And she was very interested in the course and very much into the colonial revival style, which was very much at its height at that time. So she puts in this colonial revival cooking hearth. So it is meant to look old, but it is not um, an original cooking hearth. So we are coming up the back stairs of the house. These are located off of the kitchen that we were just in. And they're very narrow, they're very steep. These back stairs were utilized by the enslaved and later free servants that would have been working in the house uh, throughout its history. And uh, there are, when you get up to the top of the stairs here, three small rooms. We do, we do think that they were um, configured, the small rooms sort of divided into these small rooms in the 1850s. So we think originally in 1785, was more of an open sleeping area, but that's just sort of conjecture. But we know that by the 1850s or perhaps the 1870s, there are three rooms up here. And uh, we can take a peek into this one room. Do you pardon the mess? We are in the middle of uh, sort of renovations at the moment, but it gives you um, a glimpse of one of the rooms. They're all pretty much the same size.
very uh, simple wall. We get a lot of questions about wall colors uh, on tour, and the answer is that we don't have a really great idea of the colors of the walls originally. So in the 1780s, uh, we would like to do further tests, but the initial test that we had done on paint colors was only looking for colors um, dating back to the 1850s time period. So um, we, we need to, there's more research that needs to be done there. Uh, but we do notice that in the 1850s, the downstairs formal rooms would be wallpapered. Upstairs, they're probably a little bit simpler than what was downstairs. Uh, and of course, in the rooms that we were just looking at where uh, the enslaved and later free servants would have resided, very plain white, almost kind of like a, a whitewash, the calcimine paint that they would have had on the walls in there, so very simple. But this, um, this room, like I said, it's, you see in the fireplaces reflective again. Uh, so these are again put in in the 1850s, that Tudor arch that you saw in the marble uh, downstairs in the parlors. So they're repeating that up here in the bedrooms. So again, a lot of what you're seeing uh, is from that 1850 period. I do want to point out the door behind me. A lot of people ask about that door. Um, we do believe that this door would have led to a pass-through that connected to the bedroom on the other side of the fireplace. So there would actually been a pass-through on either side of the fireplace. And the reason for that, there actually is a very practical reason for that, uh, for those pass-throughs. And one of them is the fact that um, it is, of course, very hot and humid here in the summers. And it would have been very important to have the windows open, of course, and get those cross breezes going from one side of the house, house to the other. And those doors would have been open with the pass-through and you had those breezes coming through, keeping the house uh, a little bit cooler. So we're now here in the second bedchamber on the second floor of the house. And uh, I do want to point out that in the 20th century, the pass-through here was converted into a closet. So uh, you can actually see some of the features that they added in the 20th century here, um, including these wonderful uh, pull-outs for hangers. So they were hanging clothing at that period. Of hangers are a, a 20th century invention. Uh, and then you can also see the wonderful floral wallpaper, which dates from, we think, probably um, the 1930s or 40s. Um, but um, but yeah, this wallpaper possibly was in the whole room here. We know that in 1937, uh, when the Lewis, uh, James, uh, John and Myrtle Lewis move in, uh, this was actually Myrtle Lewis's bedroom. And uh, we know that there was, we found evidence that there was floral wallpaper in the closet here, and also in her dressing room, so possibly the whole, the whole room. Uh, but yeah, this room right now, when you come to visit it today, we do have a lot of furniture in it that dates to the turn of the century period. And I do want to talk about that early 1900s renovation of the home. I mentioned that in 1903, the house is purchased by the Downham family. And the Downham family, they invest a lot of money into modernizing the house quite a bit. So they're the ones who do add uh, electricity. They're adding modern plumbing. So we do actually have evidence that in the 1850s there was some plumbing installed in the house. The extent of it, though, is somewhat unclear. Um, we do believe they had water coming into the kitchen in the 1850s. And there's also evidence of a holding tank for water located in the attic of the house that would have probably been a, a gravity-fed system. So it's possible they even had an early bathroom, maybe a, a water, or water closet uh, or even a, an early bathtub. Uh, system here in the house by in the 1850s, but we know for sure by the early uh, 19-teens that the Downham family are installing modern plumbing facilities here in the house. So that's the first time that you really have what we would consider modern indoor plumbing. Uh, we also know that the Downhams are the ones who put in the radiator heating. So like I said, the coal furnace, uh, they get rid of that and they put in an oil furnace in the basement and they actually uh, have radiator heating in the house um, by the early 1900s. Uh, and I do want to point out also um, just briefly the room across from us here. Uh, this would not originally have been here so it actually would have been a big hallway behind me just uh, like downstairs. But uh, sometime after the Civil War you had a lot of Lee family relatives who were staying here and living here in the house, they create another small bedroom here off of this bedroom. So there are actually three um, bedrooms at that point here in the main section of the house. Today, the room serves as a changing exhibit gallery. So we do have our exhibit that went up in March, just before the closure, uh, that explores some of the women in the house, who lived here in the house in the early 1900s, in that era leading up to women winning the right to vote. So we'll be doing a sort of virtual tour of this later on, um, probably next week. 
So we know at the, um, the top of the hallway here on the second floor, uh, this bathroom was installed. It is one of the uh, bathrooms that was installed in the 20th century. The sink and tub fixtures uh, and the toilet, we know for sure the toilet is, is from around 1930. Um, and so uh, this would have been the main bathroom here on the second floor of the house that would have been uh, you serving the two main bed chambers and a third smaller bed chamber here. today at the third level of the home and you just saw a shot of our staircase and we get a lot of questions about the main staircase here in the home it is obviously a very iconic part of the house and people ask whether or not it's original from what we can tell this staircase was altered in the 1850s so it is not uh, we do not believe it is the original staircase to the home in 1785 but it is beautiful nonetheless and of course it leads from the first level all the way up to the third floor here, which was greatly expanded during that 1850 renovation. So the original third level of the home was probably more of an attic space. In fact, you can see the original roof line here of the home. Uh, and so it would have been say, very much an attic style. And again, you can see the small windows that were added during the expansion in the 1850s. The Cavanaugh's wanted to create more bedroom space here on the third floor, primarily uh, for children. So these were children's bedrooms. They do have inside, the rooms are quite spacious, and they also have the call levers that were used to summon the enslaved and free servants to the rooms all the way up here on the third floor. So we have the two big bedrooms here. We do have a bathroom that was added later on in the 20th century, and a small um, sort of garret room that would have been utilized either as storage or perhaps a, a nursery room. We're going to step into this room here. This is on the front side of the house, so the north side of the home. You can see we do actually use the rooms that are in the third level as collection storage today, so that's why the public are not normally up here. I do apologize for the mess we are in the middle of, of reorganizing. But the reason I'd really like to bring people up here is to see the original coal grates um, and coal grate surrounds here that were added in the 1850s. These would have been installed most likely in all of the main rooms of the house here, but they've only survived up on the third floor. So um, they would have had a, a grate here to hold the coal and would have been part of the heating system here in the house in the 1850s. And they're just gorgeous. We're so glad that they survived here on the, the top level. So this, uh, this is something that is actually resting, a piece is resting on the third floor landing. Um, it looks a little, a little scary. This was actually an elevator that used to run between the stairs, so in the middle of the staircase. And this was installed by the last resident owners of the home, uh, John L. Lewis, the famous labor union leader. One of his children, his daughter, Catherine, she had a lot of health issues and some mobility um, limitation. So he actually installs this elevator lift for her to be able to access the upper floors of the home, um, probably some time around uh, 1950. And there's a little call button here. This gate actually opens up, so it would have allowed access for you to step onto the elevator. Um, and the elevator was running in the middle of the staircase through the 1990s. Um, it was removed eventually. It did not meet modern safety code, so it was removed from the middle of the staircase and actually placed here, rest now on the third floor landing. But it's been preserved because it is definitely a part of the story of the house. Uh, each family that lived here certainly left their mark on the home. So we've actually, we're actually here back on the second floor of the house. Uh, we are in that first telescoping section on the second level. So we're actually in the room that's above the 1850 dining room. And this room we refer to today as the Lewis Library. Uh, most likely it was originally another second floor bedroom. But again, the last resident owners, the Lewises, in the 1940s, they uh, installed these built-in bookcases. John L. Lewis was quite an avid reader, so he had quite a massive book collection. Uh, we don't have a lot of his original books, but we do have a lot of books that belong to various people who lived in the house over the years, from some of these law books from the early 1800s that belonged to the Lee family, uh, to quite a few books that belonged to uh, the Downing family in the early 1900s. Today, this 
room is also utilized as an exhibit space, so the exhibit that we have going on right now does highlight the life and times of John L. Lewis uh, when he lived here in the house. And I do actually want to point us over to this exhibit case, because it's kind of a, a fun place to sort of end our tour here today. But uh, we do have some images here of how the house looked when the Lewis family were living here in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Lewis lives here all the way up until his death in 1969. So um, we know they had quite a bit of uh, floral wallpaper <laughs> throughout the house, including in the main hallway. Um, and uh, this was a family home, like I said, for, for so long, um, almost 200 years of American history that's been encapsulated in uh, this one house. And what's great is that the house has never been taken back to just one time period in the home's history. So by going through the house, you really get to see all the different layers of history, which is very exciting. Uh, this tour, we were offering it, of course, um, this weekend, originally in May because of Preservation Month. Um, and this house was preserved uh, as a museum thanks to the work of a lot of people who really cared about saving the house. Um, when Lewis, the last family, uh, when they, the last family member dies, um, the house was actually under threat. There were a lot of developers who were eyeing the property here, and at one point they were considering putting apartment buildings here on the corner. Um, the house was saved thanks to a group called the Virginia Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, it sounds very grand, but they, they just operate this house. They saved this house uh, in the early 70s, and they opened it as a museum, and they still, we still operate today um, as a historic house museum. And we're very grateful to be able to share the history of Alexandria and of this house. Um, even though uh, we do have to, of course, be closed to the public right now, we are very excited to be able to bring the history of the house to you. And uh, thank you so much for watching the video. Again, I do apologize for the failure of the live to stream tour earlier this afternoon, but if you do have any questions, uh, do reach out to us. Um, you can comment below or email us at contact at leefendelhouse.org. Thank you for joining us.